Construction Casualty Lead, Zurich. Jason Presley, Construction Leader, Oxy. And the moderator for the panel, Joe Rendon, Operations Manager, Zachary Group. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Come on, it's after lunch. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> there we go, there we go. So in order to get these juices flowing a little bit, uh, I, I have a little group exercise. I'll just take a second, it's very, very easy. So today, one of our group members is celebrating his 60th birthday. He's sitting back over here. So I'd like everybody on the count of three, say happy birthday, Bobby, okay? One, two, three. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, Bobby. <laughs> Great, <laughs> happy birthday, Bobby. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna have a journey here to talk about the role of frontline supervision in uh, performance and productivity. I'd like to start off here first, as this video is playing back here, tell you we all use foremen and general foremen. We expect them to be superheroes, to be leaders, to get things done. We've been looking at a lot of tools and models, and ultimately it's these folks that get the work done. But in reality, they may be a person that was a craftsman yesterday, they might be somebody's brother, they might be somebody's friend. Uh, they may have been working in a different industry previously and are now entering the, the construction industry. And so we need to find out what we want our folks to, to do, to be liked, to emulate, and then can they actually do these things? And so that's what we're gonna discuss here today. This is my team here. Uh, we do have a really good mix of contractors and owners. Uh, we did lose some folks along the way, but had some really, really strong input from a, from a broad band uh, of folks. In order to prevent any kind of mission creep, we narrowed our research down to a couple things here. First, we defined that the frontline supervisor is a foreman or a general foreman. There were some slight discrepancies or, de or differences in definitions, but we could agree frontline supervisor is a foreman and general foreman, okay? Additionally, we focused on industrial construction. Did not go out into heavy, infra into heavy infrastructure or commercial. This is gonna center around industrial construction. Through uh, research of previous uh, CII documents and also from the various group members, we boiled down that there's 10 competencies that we want our frontline super superintendents, supervisors, I'm sorry, to have, right? There's a mix of soft skills, which you might call soft, which in reality are the hard stuff, and then, of course, craft background, general construction knowledge, problem solving, ethics. So these are the 10 core competencies that we as a group thought all of our supervisors should have. This was a breakthrough for us. When we first started uh, meeting as a group, it was so easy to go back and revisit what had been done before. Where do our people spend their time? We're all familiar with the pie chart that says there, on average there's 30% tool time, and that's been done ad nauseum. And we kind of got stuck there a little bit until finally there was an aha moment. And it was, if we had our way, without knowing anything else, what would we want our folks to do? What do we want our foreman to be spending their time on? And this is foreman first. And so what you'll see there in the highlighted sections, this is where we want them to be spending their time. There's, there's 10, 10 tasks here. And as you look through them, not all of them could be, should be considered as productive, but they have to be done. Timesheets are not productive. You don't earn anything for them, but they have to be done in order to keep business moving along. So we defined what those tasks were, and then we defined an ideal range of time, and then filled in the gaps. Okay, so you got low, right, high, except for those two that are faced there. And we also determined that it really doesn't matter whether this is an eight, 10, 12 hour shift or a crew specific, this works for supervisors, okay? So that's our, that's our foreman. Another way to look at it, where do you really want your foreman spending time? They should be supervising, motivating, executing work. That's where we want our folks to be, our foreman to be. Not spending time chasing some other things around. So, so keep that in mind as we continue our journey here. We did the same exercise for general foreman. We boiled it down to eight tasks. As again, you can see it laid out by chance that that middle range of time is where we want our general foreman to be spending their time, okay? Did the same exercise. If we had our way, where do we want them spending time? There's a mix of non-productive and productive items in there, but these are the eight things that we thought general foreman should be focused on. 
another way to look at it. Right? General foreman is supposed to be involved in a bunch of the different things to keep work moving for the foreman and their crew. It has to be a liaison between the superintendent, the, some project controls, project management, engineering, to bring documents together, to bring a plan together so foreman can execute work. So let's dive down now and what are, what are we going to look at here, right? How do the foreman and general foreman perform against those competencies I just showed you, those 10? Do the foreman and general foreman actually spend time where we want them spending time? And are there differences across populations? Now that means are there differences across the United States, across different contractor types, uh, across different uh, work types such as uh, traditional versus advanced work packaging versus lean construction, those type of deals. And also are there some differences between US and Canada as well? In order to do this, we cast a wide net survey a lot of different individuals to gather information. We started first at a CURT roundtable uh, about midway in our journey and uh, had 67 responses there and used that to kind of start a beta test for our, for our survey mechanism. We then started expanding out to superintendents. We wanted superintendents to tell us how they think or how they look at their general foreman and foreman against those 10 competencies that I just showed you. And additionally, and what we think we're pretty proud of, is we received 1,135 responses from across the United States and up into Canada from foremen and general foremen themselves, telling us where they're actually spending their time. And oh, by the way, what kind of experience they've had, what kind of training they've had, what kind of work models they've been working in, had they worked with, with uh, uh, traditional uh, advanced work packaging, uh, open shop, merit shop, um, uh, unions, that type of stuff. So a wealth of knowledge that we were able to get back and start sifting through to start looking for some some things here. We pursued that a little farther. We actually were able to do 113 face-to-face -face interviews where we sat down with those foremen and general foremen, some in the work area, some pulled back into an office trailer where we could get, get some time with them. And as you can see there at the bottom, the different work types, maintenance, traditional, AWP, work-based planning. So cast a very wide net. So we're going to kind of follow this journey with a foreman. And we'll call him Jason. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is see, is Jason qualified? I mentioned here a minute ago that we surveyed superintendents to rate how their foreman and general foreman are performing against competencies. You'll see here, we're looking at the foreman first, that in general, the foreman could be considered as good, average, but there's a couple areas that they struggle. And again, this is as measured by their superintendents. They struggle in the area of written communication, in pre-planning, and problem solving. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, those seem to be some of the traits that we really need them to excel at, especially given the more complex projects that we're seeing now, uh, the models that they have to get into, things that they have to figure out to enable to push their people to work, right? So we've got some folks that are struggling here, and yet we depend on them to do our work. If we take a look at general foreman, there's some better ratings here. The superintendents felt a bit better about their general foreman. On average, they were rated as good through very good. Although they do show some weaknesses in those same three areas that the foreman did, written skills, pre-planning, and problem solving. Now you'll notice that the, skills, the uh, scores here on these three are higher than on the previous slide. That kind of supports the notion, excuse me, kind of supports the notion that the best foremen are getting promoted up to general foremen. So the foremen are struggling, we're taking the best of them, pushing them up into the general foreman ranks, but are we addressing some of the areas that they have deficiencies with the foreman? So that was talking about competencies. Now let's see if Jason and his brothers and sisters are spending their time effectively. So from those 1,135 responses that we got back from foreman, general foreman, we pared down here for the foreman. 812 foremen responded. And as you'll notice here, we've got a widespread where people are spending their time. And I want to zero in on three key areas. So you'll see there item number five, coordinating with other crews. Over 50%, over half of the foremen are spending more than the ideal time during that day coordinating with other crews or support. This means they have to go find rigging support, they have to go find scaffolding support, or other things in order to advance their work. Similarly, 55% of them are spending time receiving, checking, verifying materials, things that probably should have been done or could have been done by other folks within the organization to supply them with those, with those things that they need to do, they need to have in order to build, build the plant. 
And finally, 43% of them, not quite half, but a very, very large number, are spending more time actually moving into other contingency work. They got shut down on something they were doing that was planned, and they're having to pick up their crew and move somewhere else. It's not productive. It's not doing the things that they need to do. And even worse, could they be moving to non-priority work, to something that doesn't need to be handled yet? They're, are they being reactive and, and selecting on their own where they need to go or where they want to go? So you start losing your hands, start losing that handle and control of where your project's going. Let's look at the general foreman. A little bit tighter spread, but there's three key, three key areas there where they're actually spending less than the desired time. The first one, planning, prioritizing, fallback work for those foremen, kind of ties in what I just mentioned here. 28% of them, 29% are spending less than the ideal time. Less than the ideal time, which is, which is turning the foreman loose maybe to choose a path that they want to go and maybe they, they don't need to be going. Almost 50% are spending less than the ideal time on constraint management. Again, ensuring that the foreman have what they need to advance the work, the planned work, the things that we've been spending time on to set that path, to identify critical path items and others, and yet they're not spending the time that they should be there to support those, for, those foremen. And last, almost 50% of them are spending less time in the work package development. They should be having an advanced look at what's available, what the desired schedule looks like, what kind of support's needed in order to provide that work to the foreman, and almost half of them are spending less than that desired time. So raise the question, why are we struggling? This may be, may be some of that, explain some of that, why we're struggling. Kind of cap that back again. Our foremen are spending too much time on three tasks. There seems to be a correlation there where the general foremen are spending not enough time on those similar tasks. If we get that balance right, would that allow that work to free up and move in a more productive manner? So for our foremen, who again have that ultimate responsibility, that last link to push our work through to be productive, we should be spending more time here with coordinating with other crafts, constraint management, and priority work in order to ensure or give a better chance of having that foreman's success. So with that, I want to turn it over to Bill, and he's going to see how this is uh, impacting the, pro the productivity of the foreman. Thanks, Joe. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll step back a little bit and let you absorb what Joe talked about. There's a lot of data right there, and it really shows tremendous opportunities to improve the competency levels of general foreman and foreman, particularly foreman. And you can see in the numbers a really wide spread around how foremen and general foremen spend their day well away from what the team considers an ideal task. And think about that. That's pretty powerful because what we're really talking about here is productivity. Now, I'm sure you've all seen this curve or ones like this before. And let's face it, this is the great shame of our industry, right? And it's, it's been around since 1994. I actually have a curve of like this that goes all the way back to 1964. And it's something that we all have to own. It's construction productivity, but it's not only a construction problem. It's an engineering problem, a procurement problem, a problem in feed, and a construction problem all together, right? Nonetheless, really the motivation for this research came from looking at things like AWP, advanced work packaging, and lean, and there's been lots of productivity improvement programs for the site, and we don't see them in this aggregate curve for the industry. And we said, well, let's take a look at maybe part of the problem, and let's face it, it's part of the problem, but an important part of the problem is are the foremen and the field supervisors, are they capable and do they have the right skills to drive these programs forward. And to connect this with the theme of the conference, we can have all the good intentions of the world, but if we do not enable our frontline supervisors with the right skills, we cannot sustain field level innovation, disruption, or transformation. And so part of what we did the research on, we said, what are the competencies of foremen and general foremen with respect to productivity enhancing practices like lean or advanced work packaging. 
And what we found out based on interviews that these competencies are fundamentally the same across different productivity programs and they're core to everything. Now there are some things that change in specifics and advanced work packaging. You know, foreman and general foreman needs to know how to deal with an installation work package, but fundamentally they need to understand pre-planning. They need basic competency in the profession. So there's some skills under here that will change, but the fundamentals are the same everywhere. And Joe had mentioned we had 113 interviews, and I can't possibly tell you all about that, but just sort of the big picture is we found nothing in the interviews that conflicts with the data that we've shown you. There's a wide range of skills out there, a wide range of people doing things. We don't see any new skills to implement. One thing of note, we did do a number of projects that were doing AWP compared to traditional. And those people we talked to on AWP projects showed better, more focused responses. They knew their job and they knew what support they had better than on traditional projects. Now, Greg Bentley this morning mentioned advanced work packaging and certainly in an industrial projects, we have the evidence now that AWP, when well implemented, does make a difference in tool time and has up to 25% improvement in field productivity and even in a few anecdotes I've heard more. And we can see support for that in our data. Here is some of the time that Joe had mentioned and uh, how we surveyed how people spend their time. We looked at the task on supervise, motivate, and execute for foreman. And on traditional projects, go to all the way to the left, you see 27% are spending four hours or less or the less than the ideal time. So that's more than a quarter are spending less than the ideal of supervising. On AWP projects, that 27% went down to 15% and the, actually we would say more than ideal time, but that's not a bad thing really. Almost half are spending the highest block of time on supervising and that's exactly what we want our foreman to do. So we see in our data support for the story of AWP. But let's step back for a second and come back to thinking about foreman and general foreman competencies. We asked them as part of the survey, and this is their self-reporting, we asked them, what training did you have or education have you had in these areas? And you can see supervisory skills, safety very high. Joe mentioned some soft skills like communication and written. 60% of general foremen, half of foremen have had some training in there and it goes down in scheduling, quality control, time management, and estimating. How can we expect people to drive productivity for us if they don't have those skills? And let's get down to lean 3D model usage, time motion studies, advanced work packaging, work face planning. Under 20% across the board have had education in those areas. Yet those are the things that are supposed to drive productivity. And so one of the basic things we have we've seen for this is we are not equipping our frontline supervisors for success. How can we expect something if we're not giving them the skills to do that? So does training actually matter? We ran a couple of comparisons on advanced work packaging because we know roughly what advanced work packaging training is because it's new. And so we said, okay, what about traditional projects? And we found that statistically significant difference, AWP training and general form and time allocation on work package development, if they didn't have any training on tradition, they would almost 40% spent too little time with some training, even on traditional projects. So it's not AWP projects, <laughs> it's a traditional project. If they've had some training, that time goes from 41 to 19% in the too low bucket and they're doing more of the right things. So training can make a difference. In AWP projects, general form and time allocation for that plan, prioritize and fallback work that Joe said was so important, if they haven't had training, they're spending too little time doing that with training, the balance goes a lot more to doing the right amount of time for doing what we expect them to do. And so a little bit of evidence that investing in the foreman and general foreman will make a difference. Now that said, let me turn over to Darren Cowan to help drive home the points. Thank you, Bill. Good afternoon. 
Many of you have probably been on research teams before, and I've been on two, and I would highly encourage you, if you've not been on a research team, please get on one. The knowledge transfer between you and your colleagues is incredible. But you'll also hear this term, wandering in the desert. Has anybody ever heard that term before? If you've been on a research team, you are wandering in the desert. And yes, we did some wandering in the desert ourselves as a research team. We've been snake bit, we've been stung by scorpions, and yeah, we sat on a few cacti. So the research team that uh, I was on, uh, lucky enough to be invited on, we came through and we found that there's two major items that need to be addressed. One is the industry level training of, yes, craft people, but also, as or more important, the frontline supervisors. Isolated efforts, when we talk about those, those are what a single company does for itself in a closed environment, if you will. In other words, they do it for themselves, it's their training program, they don't share. That, we found, does not work. So what we're gonna be talking about in a little bit is what may work. Now, the other item that we found that absolutely proved itself out, advanced work packaging training is beneficial in each environment. And that means each and every environment. AWP works. It's not an argument anymore, it works. So while we were doing our research, uh, we had to find a little bit of an anomaly that came from a carrier. And quite frankly, what this little diagram up here shows, it's nice and simple. It shows that workers' compensation losses, and we'll just boil it down, it's dollars, okay? The amount of dollars in severity in workers' compensation continues to drop. Thank the Lord, it continues to drop. That's our humanity, that's working. It continues to be driven down, and I hope for the rest of my life and into the future, it continues down to zero. That other line that's up there, however, is what we have never seen before in our business, and maybe you haven't seen it. That's the amount of construction defect. Construction defect losses rising past the point of workers' compensation. Now, some people can make the point that, well, maybe we've solved our safety issues. Maybe we've solved that. Maybe we're on a great track, and we are. But the, comp the construction defect loss is rising since basically 2013, 2014, and continue to rise is a concern. It's a great concern. Now, as a risk engineer, we're a little bit like Jack Russell Terriers on steroids. We dig right down to the bottom. We have to find out what is occurring, what is driving this. And one of the items that we find is manifesting in this anomaly, this rise, is that the frontline supervisors and the crafts are inadequately trained and inadequately qualified to perform their work. They are putting in units, systems, valves, and work that is defective. If it is not according to the plan and perfect, Basically, it's defective, and those costs continue to rise. So we need to help Jason a little bit. We need to find, we need to recruit, train, and retain qualified people. We need to get them in, we need to get them trained, and then we have to retain them. Now, I know about the transient workforce and the arguments that have gone on there for years. First off, it's not even up on the board. I'd like everyone to think about construction professionalism. Every craft worker is a construction professional. They should be treated as construction professionals. We should be the biggest cheerleaders out there talking up among the younger generations what it's like to be a professional in construction and you don't have to be the engineer you don't have to be the architect. You can be the professional craft worker going on to frontline supervision and ultimately, who knows where it might take you. 
That's number one. Number two, where do you get the best employees for frontline supervisors? From the craft people themselves. Who better to ask, who better to get the nod to bring someone to a frontline supervision position than the craft workers themselves? Craft workers are definitely, and they have great opinions on who should lead them. Item two, we'll talk about onboarding. Onboarding and orientation, two separate things. Orientation is bringing the worker, the foreman, the frontline supervisor in to introduce them to the company policies, procedures, human resources, how things work. That's orientation. Onboarding is getting that person comfortable to work in the field environment on your particular project. How they will react, how they should think, how they will mix with the other crews, where materials, equipment, and supplies are, how the procurement process works. That's onboarding. Onboarding should take what we found a minimum of three days. That's the recommendation, onboarding. Keep it separate from orientation. Last little bullet there, but a very important one. Frontline supervisors have got to have the ability to communicate, both verbally and written. We can help them with their verbal and written skills, but they must be able to effectively communicate to their crews to get the work done. They've got to be able to communicate up the chain and down. So communication skills. Our call to action, or what we like to refer to sometimes as the gauntlet of challenge that we're setting down here, is a united investment in the future. That's between owners and contractors together. Contractors and owners establishing a common core training and to make sure that that training is available in all places, especially uh, where your companies are operating. So if you're operating in the North American continent, it should be there. If you're operating overseas, the same, but a common core training developed and maintained together. Now the contractors, they're gonna perform the actual training. And they're also gonna hire the supervisors. That's what contractors do. So the contractor portion, their side of the agreement is provide the training and make sure that the, hire super, the supervision is hired correctly. But how about the owners? Where do the owners come in? What's their stake? It's no longer, I just want my project built. They need to be part of the equation. Number one, mandate that frontline supervisors are trained and that they are qualified to work on your projects. Mandate that. And only allow qualified workers to work on those projects. Raise the bar, raise the standard, get it up there. Those are our recommendations uh, for the call to action. If I can get this to work, there we go. As a special added treat today, we've been talking about Jason, and right now I'd like to introduce Jason. Good afternoon, I'm Jason. Uh, as we were putting this research team together and deciding the path we are going with it, we just took an arbitrary name and said, what about Bob? And as we looked at all the details, we noticed that, okay, that was me. That's how my career went. I started to learn to craft, I became a frontline supervisor, supervisor and moved on up. And now, in the position that I'm in, I'm noticing that the supervisors that I'm seeing in the field today don't have the skill levels that I had and the experiences that I saw and was trained by in the frontline supervision. And just, just to share that with y'all, that's how we kind of went with this path. And uh, I'll throw it back to Joe. Thanks, Jason. So, 
we've left ourselves some time here by, by design. We've actually made some challenges to you, the, the audience, right? We didn't just show you a tool, n nothing negative there. We didn't just show you a tool. We're actually making some challenges and throwing, trying to get you guys to think a different way, guys and gals, to think some stuff. So with that, I'd like to open up to questions, please. Who's got the first question? Lights. Can you turn the lights down, please? Nobody has a question. Every owner in here is ready to demand that certain standards be set to bring contractors up to a level playing field. No contractors have any issues with doing some more training here or onboarding. Sorry. Off to the right. Can we? I'm sorry. Go ahead, ma'am. Did you guys consider or discuss a formal certification program, and would that be helpful, or would that be too much of a barrier? Bill, you want to take that? Sure. So, so we, we, there, is, there are various trainings that are out there. A lot of them are more focused on craft than supervisory training. So uh, we don't think of that as a barrier. We think broadly it's an enabler. We think we need to reinvest in that and come back as an industry standard, of at least minimal standards of what people expect. And various ways to fulfill that. Um, you know, I think really the innovation for us, and it, make no mistake, it is an innovation if owners start mandating uh, qualifications, much as they did safety many years ago, then that will drive the change. Until then, the contractors don't have the money to do that themselves because they don't get paid for it. But if the owners level the playing field and say, thou shalt, everybody has to provide, and that essentially, that, that essentially funds the challenge of training the people, and we, we have to address that as, a, as, a, as an industry right now. Thank you, Bill. Question over here. Uh, Keith Gritzer, ExxonMobil. Did you look at uh, level of compensation versus competency? Actually, we did not. We did not. What we wanted to do is just say a foreman is a foreman or a general foreman is a general foreman, and they should have these skills. Now, because we did have a mix of contractors in there that were both union, non-union, we did take some looks, some, some, some uh, did a search through there, but really didn't come up with anything different. It actually made it a little easier on us to say, look, this is the model of foreman or general foreman that we, we should see. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, that's sort of my question. I'm an owner. I'm uh, Jack Small with Mosaic Company. I was going to ask uh, what was the ratio between union trades and open shop trades, and did you notice any differences? Bill, we, we, we had both in the survey, including uh, Canada and North America, and we did not see any statistical difference between them. So we did, probably could have mentioned that more in the slides, but uh, we believe our recommendations apply equally to both open shop and union environments. You know, how they get implemented may be a bit different in those environments, but the basics are the same. Thank you. Sir. Glenn Griffith with Occidental Petroleum. You talk about the importance of communication um, skills both up and down. How did you all address the issue wherein the workforce may not be generally English speaking? <laughs> so uh, I'll address that one. We hire, my company Zachary, we hire both. Um, we do try to ensure that, that the uh, foreman, the supervisor, are at least bilingual. In order to get around some of that as well though, we do try to mix our crews so that they can communicate across. So no one's left by the wayside. Additionally, we've been looking at, uh, uh, you may have heard of, I'm just, I'll just throw this out, red angle, trying to teach some folks some key uh, construction terms in both Spanish, English, vice versa, so we can uh, improve on those communication skills. Right now, I'll just say, it's in my own opinion, some of that's a little bit of patchwork, but we're trying to make those changes there uh, because a large part of the uh, construction population, the workers are Hispanic or Hispanic descent now. Thank you. And I'd, I'd just add that uh, part of that doesn't have to do with uh, different languages, but it's also got to do with the ability to write legibly and to be able to use correct terminology. And then also the verbal communication. Verbal communication to crews is not screaming at one's top of the lungs, but yet rather communicating effectively verbally. So. Great, thank you. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Uh, did you look at construction graduates? coming out of some of the programs as foreman or general foreman? Or were, did you find that most of the foreman came up through the craft, I guess, craft road? 
into those positions? Because we do have institutes that have the construction management training. Where do they plug in? Um, we, we don't specifically have data on that, but as an academic educator, I know most of the people coming out of those construction management programs would often target being you know, a field engineer as their entry level. I don't, very few of them have the career track to go into the craft. Most of the craft and most of the foreman supervisors really come up out of that craft track. So I think you guys might see differently, but that's what I see. No, agreed. agreed. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Juan Jones with Invista. Um, I was curious about uh, some of the data you showed on uh, your time in motion studies, the amount of time foreman and general foreman spend in uh, those different activities. Uh, I was wondering whether you uncovered any innovative ways to, um, in practice, actually capture that, that time. Um, how do you document, or are there any innovative ways to really, as an owner, uh, document how much time uh, foreman and general foreman spend in certain activities? So, so it, it's a tool that's part of our package, although we haven't promoted it. The survey that we used is available for you to use as well and compare and benchmark against the results. Um, you know, we have well over a thousand data points there to compare to, and so we think that captures pretty well North America for the industrial sector. Um, but it's there, you can use the survey, it's been validated, we've piloted it. And it's got quite a wide geographic spread also. Mm -hmm. Really, uh, the point of my question was, um, is that just a paper exercise, or are there any innovations in how, how we can do a better job of actually tracking that right. time? We, you know, these time and motion studies, or RFID kinds yeah. of... We, we did it as a paper videos. tracker, which is self-reporting. Um, yeah. You know, my colleagues that do computer vision stuff, the software is getting better at tracking how workers spend their time. I think for a supervisor, it's still hard to distinguish exactly what they're doing. Uh, so probably, at least for a while, some kind of self-reporting, whether it's on a cell phone, iPad, or a piece <laughs> of paper, is probably still going to be state of the art for a while. Okay. Nobody else that, that I'm aware of has got quite the breakdown of data we have. Usually it's been more aggregated into bigger chunks of stuff. Yeah, that time motion study would be a bit difficult because actually we I think, believe that we want our foreman, especially our foreman, to be staying with the crew, right, and not chasing out materials taking people to the gates and other things that would, be, would lend itself to that type of study. We really want them staying in, in one location. Uh, yes, sir, you were next. Yeah, Jason, you mentioned that the uh, frontline supervisor doesn't have the skill set that you had. Are you finding that people are being promoted too quickly? Is that, is that one of the issues? Yes, I'm, I'm seeing that they, there are some younger ones out there that uh, haven't had time to develop that skill set. Uh, I, I feel like they're being pushed into this role. I don't know if it's due to the fact of we've got people retiring faster and we're having to fill this position, but I am seeing that we're seeing some younger guys that have not seen the whole picture yet and do not have the skill set. Yes, sir. Ari Kemp, uh, Flint Yields Resources. So. Do you guys have a point of view on the foreman to craft ratio or the foreman to general foreman ratio to hit the optimal percentage of time uh, for those 10 common? So I, th I think just kind of a, be a uh, my rule of thumb might be seven or eight to one for a craft to foreman. Now, it depends on what craft it is, right? Some of your millwright crafts will be smaller. Your civil craft, depending on what part of the work they're doing, may be much larger when they're doing a mass pour. Um, with regards to foreman to general foreman, maybe four or five to one. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Dean Hamrick with Fleur. So I'll come from the contractor side. Um, I think all of us in this room spent a lot of time and effort investing in NCCER. Was that considered? Um, you know, to me, that's at least the baseline for that journey. On the open shop side. Sure. But they also have some very robust supervisory tools. Um, there's the judgment index that I don't think a lot of us have looked at. And then I think we're all guilty of when we say the tools are there, 
become an NCCER certified supervisor when they can't reach that standard, we'll remove it as a requirement. Um, so did you guys take a look at some of the materials that are out there already and consider how we could use those to at least do the initial qualification before promotion, or was that considered? You want to try that one? So, so as part of our review of the literature to come up with those competencies, NCCR materials, previous CI supervisory skills, lit broad literature review, what the team had internally kind of was boiled into that list of 10. And so abstractly, it's there. You know, we didn't explicitly study people with the NCCR supervision or training or not. That wasn't part of our, our scope. Um, you know, I think kind of our broad challenge is the industry needs to get on top of the skills. We have some recommendations for how to move forward. And, uh, you know, like the previous research team said, you know, a great next research topic would be, okay, let's dive in a little more specifically around what that looks like and do it there. All right, anybody else, any questions? One more over here. Uh, Sophia Rukowski, Texas a &M. Quick Ooh. question about productivity. Is it possible, I mean, right now, I think you focused on the productivity within each player, within each trade. Um, I'm wondering if there's a problem with the over-specialization of our industry. Um, there's an expression that, um, that projects start to fall apart at the intersection of contracts. And so when we have so many different contracts and so many specializations, uh, there is going to be some loss. And um, I was thinking about uh, Stephen Mulva's comment as well about all these different players. And there's, each one has their own legal contracts and uh, you have all this overhead that's associated with all those players. I mean, I was even thinking about um, the healthcare industry and how we have, when you want to go see a doctor, sometimes you have to see a lot of specialists. And when we talk about productivity, we often don't think about the length of time that uh, you have to wait between meeting with all the different specialists. But in a way, that there's a lot of similarity now in construction because, right, there's, you know, you have to prepare the site, the site's awaiting for the next trade to come. Could you, could you address a little bit about that? So it's a pretty broad question, um, but I think rather than letting a lot of these demands, needs percolate down to those frontline supervisors, they should be addressed by other people within that organization. Ultimately, I'll say it again, ultimately the goal of the foreman is to get work done safely with his or her crew. That's what we want them doing. Not being inundated with paperwork, with having to interpret specs and drawings and requirements and all, all the other things that should be handled at some pre-planning stage earlier. Whether a work face planner, whether with superintendents, uh, whether by contract administrators, subcontract managers, that type of stuff, right? So in order to address that, I believe, should be, you should uh, kind of segregate the work where it really needs to be and truly keep the foreman and even general foreman focused on the work at hand, working your plan, doing it safely, keeping the people there when they need to be, and also defining where they need to go next, not letting them be reactive to work when something arises. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, if there's any other discussion, we'll be set at a table at the uh, official break at 2.45, and we'd love to answer any further questions or listen to any comments. Thank you very much.